No, it's it's great to be back on Zoom. It's, I've had a big break from it. The last Zoom cafe we did was uh, the 4th of December. So um, we were Zoomed out. We'd had enough. I don't know what you guys were like after the end of last year. Did you do um, Zoom as well, Maria? Were you? Oh, do you know what? I should have asked that question. You don't have mute. You have your screen on mute. I thought if there was only five of us, we could probably have a more of a um, interactive conversation. Well, we, we used Zoom um, with um, sort of uh, case conferences and other meetings, but not, not so much about my food. Oh, yeah. That's really hard. It was really hard for us. We, we have, our whole concept was uh, socialising for people, families with dementia. So um, it was kind of a, we, we thought ourselves as irrelevant uh, in March last year. We, we really got frightened. Uh, we cancelled all of our cafes thinking we'd be back um, three weeks later, something along those lines. <laughs> Um, about the end of April last year, we or the beginning of April last year, it was starting to happen, uh, what was starting to happen, where you had elderly people could only buy their food between 7 and 8 in the morning. And that really spurred us on to how we could stay um, connected to our groups. So when COVID hit, we had 44 families we were looking after and 33 volunteers. And our volunteers are elderly themselves. So um, there was a handful of us under 50 that really jumped to action and how we could um, provide food for people who couldn't leave their houses. Um, it's just impossible if you're in a caring role to walk out the door to get some food between seven and nine, uh, eight or whatever it was. So we were really lucky. Um, we, have got, we had some networks with a, a new organisation called the Moving Feast Project or the Moving Feast Victoria. And they were, um, they were coming up with new ideas themselves because all the food from the, uh, and was the, the autumn harvest was rotting in the ground. They couldn't give it to the restaurants because they weren't ordering it, you know, the social enterprises that couldn't uh, buy this food. So this organisation was developed to make fresh food for people who couldn't leave their homes. Um, and they were really... Uh, effective during the towers. Remember the towers got closed down. They supplied fresh fruit and vegetables um, to those to those towers because the CEO of that group is also on my board member of my part of our board. So he said, Kirsty, we've got a lot of leftovers. Would you take them? Uh, and of course we did. And using that opportunity, we did it until the end of June. We were able to go to people's front doors hand the food, make it, uh, see how they were going, help them onto Zoom, um, how, what, how to use their technology, how to use WhatsApp and all of those little um, finer details on how to use a computer it was really hard for a lot of people. Um, but because we saw them every week, we were able to get to the next stage of the technology process. And over about um, four months, we had just about everybody on the network, on a network of sorts or a connection of some kind. So um, by the time July came around, we were um, in full cafe Zoom swing. We had um, four cafes a week. Uh, we were committed to putting on um, a some a, an hour of, of connection for this group um, without cancellation. So even if one or two people turned up, it was irrelevant. We still carried on. Um, we were able to find out what people's niche interests were because we were in their home. You know, we could see what books they had behind them or photos or, you know, we were able to talk about weddings and children when we grew up. And, it was, and we developed these programs or these like picture programs that we could screen share um, on how to get people with dementia to talk and tell a story and have some engagement in the conversation so that was um so those ideas came out of accident it wasn't um you know we didn't sit around at a big strategic table and go how can we stay connected it was just an opportunity we took because we couldn't see each other so by the time we got to the end of um, end of november early december we'd done over 125 zooms zoom cafes with people with dementia so um, I really encourage you to ask me as many questions as, as you want or you think a 
appropriate about how we did that. Um, I think that sets us up a bit. I don't think many organisations were successful engaging with people with dementia online. Um, we've had uh, conversations with groups in the UK as well on trying to get them um, engaged. Um, and we've had practice runs with different dementia cafes in the UK and supporting them through that. So please uh, ask me any questions um, you want about last year. Um, but by the time we did get to the end of last year, we even got some funding that's going to keep us going for the next two years. Aside from all the government stuff, we, um, we've got a benefactor, I suppose, a wealthy chap who's paying for all of our staffing to, to bring more cafes to the world. Um, he, wanted to be, he wants to remain anonymous and so he saw that the social um, side of dementia was really an untapped space on how to do it. So when he found us um, and made and developed a relationship with us over the last couple of years, he saw that we our concept was making a difference to people's lives. So he said, look, how can we make more of these cafes? And so we were able, we looked at how much it costs to set up a cafe because we've been doing these things for four years really on volunteer work. So when we costed it out, it kind of um, shocked us at how expensive it could be if it was properly staffed. So we, we put the proposal together over two years to his board and he said, yep, yeah, we, will, we will fund that for the next two years. So that means um, he's looking after us for, for currently for the four cafes that we do in three in Whitehorse area and one in Rosebud. And he's also funding us for another four to develop in regional Victoria. Um, so that's how we came out of last year. But I did want to do a little slideshow on what, who we are, what we do. Uh, it's only eight little, little, little shots of us. And, um, and then I'll encourage you to ask me any questions. Certainly what I'm about to show you will, will probably spur on some, um, questions yourselves um very relaxed and open book about our business it's not um there's not much i keep close to my chest mainly because i'd like to encourage you guys to have a go at doing this um and obviously my goal in the future is that everybody has a dementia cafe attached to their business so i'm going to do a little screen share of um if i can make this work can you guys see that yeah and I can see you down the side of my screen, yeah. so I'll keep an eye on your faces. Please, um, please interrupt me if you have a question. There's no, there's only eight little slides here. Um, so we we're a social enterprise. We we set ourselves up um, as in uh, 2018 uh, with the idea we could self-sustain um, and not rely on government funding. So that's the reason why we went down this social enterprise route and that really comes from um, you could only do that in a non-for-profit space if you're a company limited by guarantee. So that means we are managed by a board of directors who are volunteers um, and we have 10 members who have, have the overriding responsibility of and risk of the organisation and they, um, while I founded the organisation, they, they employ me as a CEO to run it. So I'm also on the board, but that's how it's structurally set up. We're also a health promotion charity. Uh, for many people who know about charities, there's only about 14 um, subclasses that, uh, that constitute what a charity is, and they're very strict guidelines. So our constitution is very much based on the health promotion aspect of being a charity. It's generally a new um, charitable status, um, 2016 I think it was added, uh, and that is just to improve the social health and well-being of a particular group of people. Um, fortunately we also have DGR status which is tax concessions, so when wealthy people come to us and say they want to give us money, they can get a kickback from the government. So that's a really good um, little um, asset for us and, and allows us to create relationships away from the traditional um, government funding. So our big why come from something I saw in the UK. Um, I hadn't seen it here uh, and if I had it wasn't done particularly well um, or consistently. Um, so we want to improve, we, we believe through 
social health and well-being. We can empower those living with dementia to be more autonomous. That means have a lot more choice, better connected, have greater awareness and live in an inclusive community. Um, and that that is that inclusivity is an important part because our system is so fragmented and this knowledge network uh, is so important. Uh, we are broken into so many different pieces. We don't share information. Uh, when I went to the UK and I saw these cafes for the first time, I recognised the village model or the, the village concept playing out in real time. It wasn't in a textbook. No one was telling me about it. It was uh, an incredible group of people working together to support each other through their chronic disease, whatever that is, it happens to be dementia. So, um, you know, there was as many volunteers as there were community members living with dementia as there were carers. Um, and there were activities going around the room as, um, as if you went to a, um, a mother's group or um, a men's shed or, um, you know, a golf club. There were groups of like-minded people connecting in areas of the room, supporting each other through conversation and socialising. And then eventually, as the relationships developed, they would have the courage to say, I've got problems with my partner or with what I'm living with, and how do you go with that? Um, and that happens over months. That doesn't happen in a 10-minute consultation. So it really took my breath away how the community was able to do that. Um, and they'd been doing it for eight years before I met them. When I came back to Australia, I didn't see anything like it. Um, I was lucky enough to see a Memory Lane Cafe um, and it looked similar, but it, it didn't have the community um, aspect. I don't want to discredit the, the group, it just wasn't what I saw in the UK. So that's what inspired me to start this up. Now, I only was going to do one, um, but that my community loved it too much. So what we actually do after the last four years of playing with this concept is our job is to empower you guys to create social groups for families and people living with dementia. So that's going to be our motto is to show you guys how to do it. We've had so much experience and we've made so many mistakes and we've had so many successes that we need to, to hand it over now. Um, our mission is that uh, our social groups, which are called cafes, are completely centered around the individual with dementia. Um, there's a chap, um, Kit, oh, remind me, um, Kit Wood? Kit Wood. I can't remember his first name. Does anyone remember? It's Tom. Tom, Tom that's Kit right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, he talked about pe personhood a lot. He, came, he was a 90s, kind of came out of the box in the 90s about personhood and that's developed now to be person-centered care and if you, anyone gets a chance to read that it really is um, a fascinating look at the personhood concept and so our cafes are centered on that um, so that's really important for us and if we can uh, if we can develop this model across Australia under one um, network through interconnected adaptive responsive strong partnerships we might just be able to pull it off um, and that's that's sort of the long-term goal here. So I've just got a couple more slides to show you what happened in 2016 to 2020. Um, a pretty good effort considering we didn't have any employees. I think we had, um, you know, moments where we thought we couldn't do it anymore. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, we become friends with each other. So when people when people die, it, it, it's quite overwhelming you know having to support each other through it um, you know getting the food in there the children so many children come through our doors um, learning how to have children safe policies um, in 2017 was a terrific learning call uh, learning curve um, significant volunteer hours so our core business is really in the volunteer support areas um, even beyond looking after those with dementia because they need a lot of awareness and um, encouragement because they themselves have probably had grief um, in life experiences in this dementia space which is why they're connected with us in the first place. So the next the next slide, uh, this is our, the last one, is kind of a, a bit of a shock on how 
how we're going to do this is going to be a team effort. Um, by November 2022, we should have eight cafes in place. Um, it looks like we will have um, three in total in the Mornington Peninsula area, three in Eastern Melbourne. Whether they stay in the current locations or not, we will find out this year. Um, when we introduce membership and partnership models, we'll see how that goes. Change is not easy. Uh, and then um, where the other th the other two will be in country Victoria. So we haven't um, established those locations yet, but we're yet to create a, um, a expression of interest form, which will list all the things that we need from an organisation before we implement a cafe. And because we're already funded for all the training and all of the... Um, all the support in that first year, then the people that we choose um, or are the right people for this for this model uh, won't have any overhead, so we won't, we won't need to pay for anything, which is terrific. It's a really unique opportunity. Um, so we also work with children, um, the, the ten-year-old kids, year grade five specifically. Um, this group we have learnt don't have the um, um, I, they're, they're malleable. <laughs> it's, they have information that stays with them. Um, that they, they have a, um, they don't have as much stigma. Uh, they're interested in leadership and ideas and connecting with their community. By the time they get to grade six, that's changed already. Uh, we've we had grade six kids in our group, even year nine kids, and they already um, have a lot of apathy and. Uh, stigma attached and fear of being different but grade five kids aren't like that at all so we've really stuck with that that group um, they're learning a great deal about themselves that's the point is that they understand uh, brain health not just dementia and also how to speak to their elders uh, and how to have some leadership within their small groups that we create so we have Blackburn Primary School that we work with and have done for the last, um, well, since 2016. And we're also starting a program with Eastbourne Primary at uh, in Rosebud. With that Eastbourne Primary one, we've uh, organised our members to attend the school and they will go into the school to enjoy morning tea. Whereas with the Blackburn one, we have the children come across to the cafe. So I dare say the Eastbourne model will probably come up trumps because we can go where the kids are where the, where the, rather than move the children to a different location. But we'll see by the end of this year how that goes. Um, so it's a real test, real pilot. Uh, we are looking for a third partner in that space. So if anyone has a... Um, an organisation with experience in this, please let us know, especially in the research area. Um, that would be great to collect our data and analyse it. Um, we, have, um, we are hoping to have interconnected networks, so our eight cafe sites and more will all talk to each other. Um, that's really important. That's the, that's the point. Um, we are creating a SharePoint site, which is an intranet site. Um, if anyone knows Teams or Microsoft Suite, it's very, very powerful to bring people together and collaborate um, with a, you know, it's a non-closed environment. And we really believe in that, um, that inclusiveness and um, adaptive responses uh, to everyone's problems, uh, each other, exactly the same as what we're doing now, um, but under the same, under the one, you know, concept of the socialising uh, with dementia. Socialism with dementia. Membership and partnership models are a big deal. Uh, we, we think we can do this. Uh, this is going to be our funding model, really. We think we can have a better membership environment. Um, it's be cashless, so that's that's helpful. Um, paperless. The, um, the, me the partnership model will be that we all have the same quality controls and we all adhere to the same concepts and rules and philosophy and we hold each other to account. And that comes with your forums and online chats and collaborative spaces. Uh, and the partnership model will have um, rules, I suppose, of delivering the cafes um, so that they are consistent 
while still maintaining the cultural needs of the community. So if we were to create a cafe in far north, uh, Northern Territory, far north Queensland, that, that has to be, um, it has to be responsive to the local community. It, it can't be based on Blackburn, but the quality and the structures still need to be similar. Um, and this is where I would be keen to get you guys involved um, with the quarterly inf community information days. It, it took us a long time to figure out how to involve um, your information on your businesses and your specialities and how we can translate that into the cafes. Be uh, because we're so social uh, focused, it's really hard to talk about business um, or, or aged care um, in a technical way. Uh, it changes the environment and it's not fun. So we started doing these community information down, days down in Rosebud uh, just before COVID hit and they were really, they were really good. We were able to deliver information um, really well and have a lecture theatre sort of style. Um, while having those with dementia, we had a, the volunteers working with them in another space. So you weren't, you didn't have to leave anyone behind. So it was still very in, in connected or inclusive. Um, and it also allowed us to be um, sort of involved organisation that we wouldn't normally involve. And it wasn't a sales tool. It was, this is what we're really good at and this is how we do it. And this is how we can help you rather than say, we've got the best organisation um, because, you know, we've got 45 different sites. Like it wasn't that, it was, you know, music therapy, for example, is something in our um, dementia environment and this is how we do it and these are the outcomes. It's, it's a, so we're really clear on what we talk about in those information days. Um, the members find out soon enough who are doing well in their local community businesses and who aren't because they share everything. Um, and that's something we don't get involved with too much. We give, them, um, we give them an environment to do it, but we don't record it or take notes or even discuss it. So they have something called a care and share group where we invite the carers to go and spend some time together. Um, and it's an opportunity to grieve and to download um, and that's where they talk about organisations privately. So, um, and they do a lot of sharing. More, more of that is your, your physios, um, GPs, neuros, people like that or people they've done respite with. Um, it's generally very positive, so I don't want to scare you. It is, they're there to support each other and so they do help with how they get involved with organisations rather than the outcome. So it's, it's a fascinating space. Um, oh, and the last two things, um, we're going to start some online sales next year or this year. We've got some funding um, to start an online presence, which is super scary because I've never done this before, um, where we're going to be selling stuff online with dementia products. Uh, and that's going to allow us to be a bit more self-sustainable. Don't know if it's going to work. We're going to give it a go um, and, and think about it at the end of the year, whether that's the right way to do it. And we need a major fundraiser. Uh, we've got something in the pipeline. Um, last year, we've had to postpone it like everyone else is fundraising. Um, but because we've got so much on the table, we're looking for an organisation who can do it for us and then um, have a you know partnership contract in place where everyone gets paid so that's our that's that's it you guys so if you wanted to connect with us there's just three four social media areas that we um are linked into and spend a bit of time on and then that's our website down below so check it out and see what's there and i would love 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 for any comments or feedback on what we do because um it's it's yeah can you just tell us a little bit about how uh, without COVID, how the umbrella operated? Because I think I tried to refer someone to you a year or two ago 
And I don't think the person attended because he had a behavioural variant FTD and he was just too unsettled. So can you tell us what the program involves? Because, I mean, we, we are likely to refer clients yeah. that we see in the aged person's mental health service mm -hmm. to something like the Umbrella Cafe. Um, yeah. yeah. So we would... Uh, the first place of referral would be on the website. There's a registration form there, or you can contact me directly. We're not so big where you won't get a reply. Um, and that's really important. What we do is we have a, uh, the first, so I'll talk about the structure of those two hours that they're together and then what we do over a long period of time. So the first two hours, the first half an hour, we meet and greet. Um, we have a little registration at the front where somebody welcomes them um, and we have newsletters and stuff for what's happening or what is happening, what has happened and notices. They come down into the room and it's immediately, it looks like it's a, a cafe, um, tablecloth, things in the middle, there's nostalgia stuff on the, you know, around the edges, uh, like a button tin or you might have uh, travel books. Uh, we know our guys well before they walk in the door. So we've already had a conversation with them on the phone, what their interests are, um, what they don't like, what are trigger behaviours, um, what music is a big no-no. So we and our volunteers know this as well. So if somebody struggles with a type of music, we make sure that's just not playing and everybody's aware of that. Um, there, are, there was... Um, one lady whose mother, she wanted to see her mother all the time, but one of her memories uh, was playing with the buttons. And, and I just mentioned that because it was so profound when she, when she did have a button pin, uh, button tin, you know how there was always a collection of buttons in the house. Mm -hmm. So memories came from that and, and immediately she was so relaxed that her partner was able to talk to somebody else about what they were going through and how they could... Um, get through the day uh, and that's what we do in that first half an hour is is make people feel relaxed so they come with partners they come with a always 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 because we aren't a respite we're not funded for respite we're certainly not regulated for it either um, we're not funded for the carers support um, you know funding streams we, so we are a unit of people supporting each other um, and there's no funding for that so we have to create our own and that's that's why We've got these all these ideas coming in left field. They have to come together and they have to take responsibility for each other. Um, okay. and, and we have to work as a unit, as a family unit, and all the volunteers um, work at how that couple can be husband and wife or mother and daughter without the care of a person with dementia kind of label. So mm. we want to take that off the table and make it like we used to do um, in a very, very social um experience as a unit um, really important so you need people with fairly like involved, more, families. Uh, involved families but also uh, in the early stages you couldn't have anyone that would be getting up wondering being disruptive or anything like that not generally no you would find we we have consistently have people in at the point of diagnosis like maybe a year after the diagnosis um, and that they become so connected to the group, they're there until the day before they go into aged care. And a lot of our volunteers are actually ex-carers or they have been in the program for that whole time. So um, they're very aware of what they want, what needs to be done with the group. So it's a massive range. We, don't, we wouldn't get anyone um, in the later stages dementia to look at socializing as a concept because their main concerns are the functional areas of their lives rather than the social areas of their lives. They're more interested in um, having, you know, someone show them how to use the, sh you know, do the showering or, you know, making meals or, the, you know, the, that stuff happens so much later. They're not, they've gone past the social interest. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, but we do have people start at that area where they think, oh, I just need to get out of my house. Um, he's driving or she's driving me crazy. I need to have some space for me. What can we do? Um, or they've been pushed out by a, uh, a son or a daughter that says, mom, 
guys need to do something. You know, you can't just sit around the house all day. So it's it's those those are the first conversations I have, and then eventually, as the you know twenty minutes goes on, you see the real chronic, um, desperately um, problematic areas of their lives um, that we can link in or refer them back out to other organizations and that happens over a couple of months um, but it doesn't happen immediately it's just too frightening and it's just too familiar with the clinical and medical environment so um, we have after I'll just finish what, what I was going to say too because what is most important is we have something called a care and share program which I mentioned before um, after that first half an hour of people feeling comfortable um, there is an invitation for the carers to talk privately. Um, and there is a social worker that facilitates that. Um, nothing's recorded, it's not documented, it's not a place where we report on anything unless it's uh, for emergencies or abuse, elder abuse that we need to report. Um, so I'm a mandatory reporter, so that has to be done um, as a registered nurse. Oops. Um, this is a, a really impressive space and I didn't know if it would work or not, but we started doing it in 2019 um, where we would, they would self-refer. So we were empowering them to, to actually look outward to organisations that could help them with areas of, say, suicidal ideation would be one of them, um, you know, how to get onto my age care, um, how, to, how to cook a meal that they're actually going to eat um, how to connect with them when they don't remember who their children are. So that all comes out in that half an hour and it is only half an hour. They stick to te generally one area that comes up in the first few seconds and then they'll, they'll try something else in a fortnight. But what, I, what happened was I watched them over the course of 2019 come out of this room more and more powerful, like they had their shoulders back and their chest, so I can do this and they were making decisions with with purpose they weren't being pressured or coerced into making these choices about having um package uh, uh, package people weren't even registering with my age care when with they first come in um people were convinced they would never use respite um you know my i'm never going to use my age care facility ever and so all that changes after they have this peer support um, and there's always one person in, in a stage ahead of you so that you can sort of see where the pathway is. Um, that's, and then after this finishes, it's about a quarter past 11 by this stage and 45 minutes have gone by where the volunteers um, are working one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, even with the children, on one, with one person doing an activity that is specific to them not necessarily to the whole group, although that does happen. Um, if, we, if we have a mathematician, we'll have old calculators. So, and all that stuff's generally donated on a call out to the local community um, or, or music in a corner or something, there'll be a music group forming in the, in the corner. Um, when we're all together about quarter past 11, we then have a massive group activity that, and the concept of that is bonding us as a unit, like a family. So um, we would watch something together and comment. We would um, have a, you know, this is your life experience, or we would have a, um, a dance, or we'd have gardening, or the kids would come in and do it, their own little theatre production. But it would always be suited to what they want or their interests, interest areas. Um, some of our volunteers are incredibly skilled, so they'll come in and do a show and tell and, and we'd be so proud of them and, and encouraging of them. Um, we've got one guy who uh, is well known for being a quiz expert, so we'd have quizzes for him uh, at his level. And, and that would, people would know this, so they'd be like, yeah, you can do it, you know, keep trying. So that happens until we start to head out at 12 o'clock and that's the whole cafe. That's how it works. There's not a, a massive... Um, focus on dementia per se, although we do have a table that's full of your brochures and full of uh, information and, you know, PDFs. So more PDFs than you know what to do. You know, the little Dementia Australia have them. Um, 
what is communication, what is Alzheimer's, what is this, what is that, or how to connect. And there's there's so many of this, so much of this stuff you don't see it. If that makes sense, it's overwhelming. So we probably got to do that better. But that is not the priority of why we're there. It's not about dementia. It's about who we are and what we want as a group. And people can come from any area. Like if you've got three in Whitehorse, so can someone from Knox or you know Manningham come? Absolutely. We've got people from Croydon. Um, someone's come down from Diamond Creek. Um, there is, we think, uh, Croydon, uh, Hillsville. She comes, she stays with her son in Blackburn, but she lives in Hillsville. And I think, Sarah, she used your service. She knows your service quite well. So um, that's okay because we don't have a zone. Um, the only thing we're prohibited by is our capacity. Um, and we're really sensitive on our, the hearing or the auditory environment. So if we have too many people in the room, it actually defeats the purpose of socialising because you just get so overwhelmed by the noise um, environment. So we do try and keep our groups um, relatively managed. So we always do a, a auditory assessment, an auditory assessment before we start the cafe. Um, so we have in Blackburn a capacity of about 15 couples and at the moment we have after COVID 10. Uh, Box Hill we have a capacity of eight and we currently have six there at the moment. At Kunung we have a capacity of six couples and we have there four um, and Rosebud has got a waiting list. Like they've got a capacity of 12 and they've got another 12 couples waiting, which is why we have to set up another cafe in, in Rosebud because we've already got the people there. Um, so we're just hopefully, um, fingers crossed in the next two months, we can sign some contracts and get that started before June. So, um, so it's big. It's My a, final it's a, question, when do you envisage face-to-face contact? They start tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, because I've actually got I've got a client who is a user of our service, but she's caring for her husband who's just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and I'm desperate to help her mm. get something, but everything's been closed. Oh yeah. You know, so okay, I might talk to you. Give me a call. I'll yeah. give you a call, and we can talk. Okay, thank you. No worries. That's easy. Um, yeah, get in with that. The if we the more we have for those other three centres in Whitehorse, we will actually increase the frequency frequency rather than the size. So we have a relationship with these venues where we can do them weekly instead of fortnightly. But we're just not ready yet until we until we change that. Okay, thank you. I can see they've got like there's someone from Regis. I'd love to hear your voice and what your what your role is and Swathi as well. Um, I can't see you. I can only see your names and um, it'd be great to hear from you if you have the courage to turn your phone your microphones off and talk to us. So Maria, where about are you guys from? Where what service okay. do you have? So Donna and I work. We're both clinicians. I'm a social worker. Donna's a nurse. We're part of the Aged Persons Mental Health Team, which is part of Eastern Health, and we're based at the Peter James Centre. So we see people who are acutely unwell. Yes. With the dementias, we only get involved if there's behavioural issues associated with the dementias. And so, yet the other services are unsuccessful. And, and yeah, and other uh, services are unsuccessful. So, you know, we have, um, we have an inpatient unit where people that are acutely unwell and the risks are high, we can actually bring them in for um, assertive management. But we're, Donna and I are both from the community team and we've got a large community team. So um, it's useful to know and we can pass this information on um, to our other you know, colleagues to be mindful to refer people to the cafes. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, that would be great, Marie. I mean, it'd be so good to, to do that and, and actually um, communicate and in the progress that we're having and vice versa um, because it is very social it, it isn't we don't there deal with gap, though. there is a gap for people who don't have involved family members or they're totally burned out and just really need a respite break there's a bit of a gap there is what I'm sort of noting there's well then you send them to Caledonia yeah <laughs> we do 
<laughs> we do. We absolutely do. We we've uh, we we've noticed women are a little bit braver than men when it comes to looking for social ideas. Um, uh, for for I, I, I guess is is based on the fact that women generally look for socialising as a form of mental health uh, from very early on when we have our babies or even as young women. So uh, no disrespect to you, Nan. I hope I haven't offended you then. Um, so they tend to make contact with us before the burnout happens. Um, and then when we do start to see the burnout occur, which is very clear, they probably wouldn't know it themselves. We then start to say, have you thought about um, getting some respite? And then, the, oh, I would never do that to my husband conversation comes in. I said, yeah. oh, have you spoken to so-and-so? She's had some respite. And then that's the point when I start to take a step back and then they have that combo. Sure. And invariably it happens. Are the centres all opening up like Caledonia and Villa Maria, Carina, are they now opening up for face-to-face -face sort of contact? Uh, Sarah, are you aware? So at the moment, the only um, social support services that are open in the East are Caledonia, Donwood and Olivet. Um, unfortunately, Carina will not be restarting um, at all. Um, uh, and... Yeah, uh, that's yeah. the area where my client lives in that area. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, they won't be studying. Um, and a lot of the council-funded services are looking at opening um, in the next couple of weeks. So um, just depending on the amount, you know, that we stay on low cases and that sort of stuff, mm. um, places will be opening up. Unfortunately, Caledonia has closed our referral portal because we had to deal with the 30 or so referrals that came in over COVID um, that we couldn't put into the service or, or okay. assess at the time. But we're getting there, we're getting there. Yeah, it's tough. So, so it's, it's tough, isn't it, getting people mm. to look okay. in. Yeah. We, we're governed, we're, we're led by our venues as well. So our venues um, were, slow to open we had our first cafes in december sort of quietly um just to give people some confidence to step out of their houses uh, we're all marked stuff and we went outside and we had morning tea but it was it's going to be okay morning tea um and and you don't need to be scared to come out it's, you're okay now there are people here to support you um so it was really important for us just to even have half an hour together and that's how tomorrow will be as well, the next two cafes. Um, and we're starting some barbecues up next week and the week after. And it, it's going at their pace. It's it's not it's not a full program. You know, even the social workers won't come in until the end of February, early March. So um, we know that our core business is just to stay connected. There wasn't, there's not a a science method or a regulatory method behind that and, and we can do so much with that and that that's enough you know um, um i just read in key's message from regis um that's okay you're having some trouble with your tech um or video can i speak to you in key i know that um Regis Home Care. I'm not sure which one you're at, but I set up a cafe in an aged care facility for six months. It was extraordinary. I really encourage you to think about this. Um, please said, type me a message as I talk so I'm not at, speaking out of turn. Um, I set up a dementia cafe inside an Advent Care on Central Road in Blackburn, Nutterwadding. And what we did was we trained those individuals. We used the concept of volunteering, but we used the residents who didn't live with dementia as the volunteers, not outside um, community. And we saw the facility as the community. Uh, with the, and the concept was that we were to decrease stigma attached to dining room experiences. So they wanted to have a more inclusive eating, uh, eating times. So if that of interest to you, please get in touch um, on how we did that. 
we used our volunteer training models and converted it to residents who don't have a cognitive disability to run the program. So have a go if you haven't done it. Um, otherwise, give me a call. <laughs> and Swathi, yeah. What's Swathi's background? We're about to see you from, if you can text me a message. Can I ask one more question? I know I've asked Of course. Questions. Oh, I'm very oh, nervous. Do you meet? Is it weekly, fortnightly, monthly? Fortnightly for all of them. Um, right. The more, the better. We did it monthly. It's just too yeah. hard to stop and start. Yeah. You know, you sort of build up this your fantastic social experience and everyone's enjoying themselves. It's like a reunion and then it's a, you, you sort of crash yeah. and burn. Fortnightly is good. Yeah, fortnightly is much better. Um, weekly is even better again, but that comes down to money. Mm -hmm. And so we have to wait until that happens. But that's our goal. Um, there's no reason why... Um, our model can't be done more often if we have the funding. Please, if anyone's got any more questions for me, I'm I'm really I'm open to this. And if you'd like me to come and visit your organisations and talk, I'd be absolutely delighted to do that. Yeah, we might we might get that happening. I will talk to our manager. Uh, apologies, Donna and I have to leave because we've got some uh, yeah notes to clinical work. Okay, but lovely. Uh, thank you very much. And no thank worries, you Sarah, Marie. for organising it. Okay. I, thank, you. thank you, Sarah. Lovely to meet you both, Donna and Maria. I look forward to meeting yeah. you again. Thank sure. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Looks like we lost Nan, but that's okay. Yes, that's okay. Um, Kirsty, you were talking about um, that our, our system is broken in so many places, which it is, and that's one of the reasons that Elizabeth and I have set up the, the knowledge networks to try and re rebond some of those um, some of those connections um, across agencies, across and I think I said this to you across funding streams, across different government agencies as well as private and um, social enterprises. So if somebody wanted to, for instance, me or Kalanina wanted to um, set up a, a umbrella dementia cafe, what would be our process? I think the first thing you need to do is create an environment that is specially geared towards socialising, that it isn't um, a place, it was, it's not part of your sales funnel, that it actually feels like it is a, a quiet place like or a place that the families can meet as a unit. Um, a really simple concept, uh, and I said this to a, a community house just recently who we couldn't support, um, having a, a coffee machine and the and your entrances with lounge around that space um, is the first port of call um, and to have an activity happening. So you would invite people to that space, but an activity that is looks like it's for the public, that it's not private and private space. Um, it could be outside as well. So it is, um, it's trying to get the family to come through those doors and be and be engaged rather than just a drop-off environment um, and that's that's challenging but it it's in the community houses it's the other way around so you would have the carer come and do an activity and leave their partner at home that's got dementia whereas I expect with you guys it's leaving the person with dementia in your services while the carer has a break so um, it is trying to understand the unit, the couple, and working with that. Um, that's it's trying to find some like-mindedness with another couple and, and connecting them like a match make. And I would recommend that you are hands off as well. So it doesn't look like you're manipulating this situation, um, which it can look like sometimes. Um, our relationships work really well when there's like-mindedness and att attachment theory starts to happen uh, and they're more inclined to keep coming back. Um, another one is to have set time every week without negotiation of when that is happening um, so that even if someone's had a bad hour, uh, the day, just before it starts, they're not thinking they'll miss out completely. There's no stress. So I'll just go next week. Um, that's that's another one um it's good to have a contact person that is able to literally text individuals that their relationships there there's a whatsapp group 
as well. It's really, really beneficial for us. Um, we have must have about 15 WhatsApp groups of different, different interests. So um, don't be afraid to, to get vulnerable. I think that's, and, and be yourself. I share family photos as well, which in my professional world, that wouldn't be um, PC, I suppose. Yeah. And so they get to see me as, um, so that would be, that's the psychology behind doing social groups. Mm, that's where I would start. You will make mistakes, but don't be afraid. Keep going. Don't worry. If one person or two people turn up, just keep going. I've had that. 2017 was a slog. Just trying to encourage, keep coming, guys. It's going to be okay. Um, and when you see the gaps with your families and your couples, you go, oh, that's what they need. Oh, they need that now. Or we need to get that. Uh, we need to get Hearing Australia in, in for that reason. So it's the relationship that develops the service, not the service that develops the relationship. Mm. Yep. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think there are any other questions. Thank you so much for coming along, Kirsty. Is there anything yeah. you want or could gain from the network? Um, I just think just keep doing it. Don't don't stop. Um, it's when people start to gain um, information from each other in this, what's happening now. And I think with even with Maria uh, wanting to catch up that. Um, that evolves into yes. massive things. Um, I would love to see um, a, a value system that we all adhere to and that we all keep each other accountable uh, because it is um, at risk of, of something taking over and, and going in a different direction for funding reasons. So do have a value statement and, and keep everyone on top of that so that there's no... Um, it doesn't go into a tangent would be my would be my interest um and i've just seen swathi's message shame that men are rock turns you down um oh they didn't turn me down i turned them down <laughs> so it's not and it wasn't personal it wasn't personal what i had to do after 2017 i realized that being biased towards one organization excluded all the others so i had to um say thank you so much for the money i think it was 600 dollars in total um we're going to use that to buy signs which we did and um we're we'll, we're going to be okay. We'll put all your brochures in our on our table, and we found other ways to to pay for our um, room hire, which was a movie night or something for the rest of the year. So, no, if you want me, Swathi, to come and talk to your guys, I am I'm delighted. Even if it's the subject based, like socialising, rather than who is Umbrella Dementia Cafe, because you know that's super boring. You know, if I can talk about how socialising can improve people's lives. I'd love to do that, for example. So, and to, you know, empower your volunteers or your staff. That would be my gig. Thank you yeah. so much for coming along. We were a small group, but we were a very interested group, I think. All right. Well, wish you all the best, Sarah, and take care and send me the link when you've got it sorted. I will. No worries at all. Thank you very all right. much. Enjoy your afternoon, right. ladies. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.